Hi, welcome back. It's been uh, quite a while and uh, I wonder how your summer has been. Um, I suspect that there are some common uh, themes, one of them being that it was a lot colder or cooler than we uh, might have hoped for and maybe a little bit wetter as well so uh, we might be missing those kind of those sun rays hey <laughs> and uh, the other thing that I've kind of picked up from people is that um like I had literally been saying to people oh August we just work at a different pace in August it's a little bit of a slower pace a little bit quieter um, and, and things calm down quite a bit ready for the kind of the manic autumn term um but it hasn't been so this this year, and I don't know if you found that to be the case. I'm I'm hearing quite a lot of stories where it is is the case, and um, so I'm sorry that it's not been as warm as you might have hoped, and it's been maybe a little bit busier than you had anticipated. But I hope that um, through through the the stormy clouds and and through the busyness, there have been moments where you have encountered God unexpectedly, maybe uh, through a conversation with a friend or a stranger, and that God has been very present to you um, during your cold wet summer <laughs> but I have to confess that I did actually have the most wonderful ending of my summer and I spent it um, at Prospect Farm which was basically a, a camping and um, Greenbelt wasn't running I always go to Greenbelt love Greenbelt it wasn't running so it did a real scaled back very scaled back kind of gathering and um, and it was just the most beautiful wonderful time and uh, there were some things that really struck me about it. Um, the first was, oh, the people were so lovely. Like, we were putting our tent up, neighbours came over, um, helped us put it up, and that was just so lovely and kind. I don't know who they were, but thank you. Um, and then we were having a cup of tea round um, in the evening by our tent, and then another neighbour came up and introduced themselves, and she was absolutely lovely. She was called Jane, husband was called Andrew. And, um, and each night we kind of gathered and shared and chatted, and it was so just great meeting these people um, with such amazing kind of stories and they are such wonderful and lovely um, questions but also what really struck me was the range of ages that there were at that kind of gathering um, so it's about I don't know 1,500 I think of us <laughs> um, so many um, children families had come for like a weekend of camping um, and I came with two people from my church and it really struck me that one was recently married, newly married, like four months in. And another of, of, the, of, my, of the company that I kept um, was recently um, widowed. And um, we spanned quite a, a wide age range, just the three of us. Um, but how beautiful it was spending time with them. Um, we, we laughed, we cried, we did the whole emotional range. And one of the things that we went to um, together was like a facilitated conversation of about like, you know, a few hundred people. I mean, we might struggle to facilitate a church meeting sometimes, you know what I mean? But this was like facilitating all those different range of voices, all those different perspectives. And uh, we could all choose what topic we wanted to talk about. And uh, we settled in, uh, in the end on um, Afghanistan. So like no light subject, hey? I mean, it gets your heart, doesn't it? It gets your head thinking. You just can't kind of begin to think about um, solutions or what we might be able to do. Um, but this conversation that we had in this tent was unbelievable and we heard from an 18 year old who was so brave to stand up share her perspective and um and her her, her voice wobbling as she um empathized with the women and the uh, and the girls that won't be able to get the opportunity of the education that she was going on to um in September we heard from another lady who shared how her her, her house had burnt down and um, a few years ago and her family lost absolutely everything apart from the clothes that they were standing in but how her community gathered round her family and supported them and, and, and provided for them and she was empathising with what it might mean for a family to lose absolutely everything and where was the community that would gather round them 
we heard from a man whose son had um had been serving in Afghanistan and one week in had lost his best mate over there and um, I had a chance to chat with them after as well and they were sort of sharing how it felt that the son had spent more time under the table because of the attacks than had done behind the desk in that way and the fear that they carried knowing that their son was out there and the questions that they now asked was was it worth it um, we heard from a guy who was a director of an NGO that worked in Afghanistan and he shared some of the history and that perspective too. Such a range of voices, all unprepared, but came and shared their perspective and it was just wonderful to be there. It felt safe. They created it in a way where different voices could be heard, different perspectives could be heard and um, he the guy that was facilitating stressed about being kind to one another and that even if you felt you were coming with a different voice different perspective that you would be welcomed and we would be kind to you and so there was that kind of real sense of safety in the sharing of these really big stuff as people were kind of articulating their voices and their thoughts for the first time and then through it all though in the backdrop we could hear the children playing. There's like a play area with some toys um, out the back. And you could hear them having their fun, their banter, um, some of their disagreements and that kind of thing. And it made a beautiful backdrop. They were still very much in our midst, midst in that way. And then to one side as well, there was people um, having a pint or having a cup of tea or coffee and, and just ch chatting, just gently chatting in the background. Weren't quite participating in our discussion, gently chatting in the background. I just love that breadth where everybody kind of found their place. So um, whilst I was at Prospect Farm, I ever the optimist, I brought three books with me thinking that I was going to have time to sit in my chair with a cuppa, reading my books. I tell you, I got, a, I didn't even get one chapter done. However, I did start reading this book, five pages of it, um, called The Practical Theology of Childhood about welcoming children into our midst. And I thought actually the context that I was reading it in was brilliant because children were very much welcomed. They weren't shushed or um, rushed out or anything like that. They were very much in our midst and it was wonderful for them to be there and for, for, it was wonderful for me to have them, all, all these children, there. And uh, But this book it opened with this story um, about how this lady took her two-year-old to a family-friendly restaurant. But the two-year-old was a little bit hungry. And what do two-year-olds do when they're hungry? They cry and they make quite a lot of noise letting their caregiver know that they are hungry. And so this mum took her um, child to the salad bar just to see if there was something that they could get to um, kind of appease her whilst they were waiting really for the, the, the food and, uh, in that way. And as they were at the salad bar, a gentleman took it upon himself to come up, to wag his finger and to say, for Christ's sake, can you not keep your child quiet? Now, I suspect that all of us hope that our churches are welcoming and friendly um, and inclusive of children, that we want to be a child-friendly church. And I really hope, I don't think any of us would have churches where people would go wagging fingers into the faces of a child and telling them to shut up. <laughs> but maybe we have people that tut and look and make parents feel really uncomfortable about the noise and the presence and the felt presence of their child in our midst. And that's because the spaces that we tend to create in churches, we might say are welcoming of all ages, but are actually so geared up, aren't they, towards adults. We focus on the brain, the cerebral thinking, do you know? So it doesn't engage with the development of where a child might be at. And we like our spaces to sometimes have silence and to have that kind of reverence to them. We know when to speak, when not to speak. A child doesn't understand that and is vocal and doesn't know <laughs> those kind of things. So uh, we might say that we are a child-friendly space, 
But is that actually the reality? And I come across people all the time that say, oh, I don't do children. We love them, but we don't do children. Ministers saying, you know, oh, don't do children. Let's We, we delegate that bit out <laughs> in that way. But it strikes me that the Great Commission isn't just for the 18 pluses. It is for all ages, for all people. All people need to know and experience the good news. And that includes children. And we obviously know from our Bibles how Jesus drew them into the middle, didn't push them out to the side where people were trying to rush them on, hurry them on, get them out of the way, he was like, no, I welcome the children. So it says in Mark 10, people were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them, and the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, let the little children come to me, do not stop them. For it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them and blessed them. We know how important the kingdom is. So why don't we take children in our midst more seriously? when it's a sign of the kingdom? Why do we move them out the way into separate rooms, not seeing that as proper church, the real church, but get, getting them ready for the real thing? It just doesn't make sense and it isn't what we read in our Bibles. But I know it's complex and it's not straightforward. And I know that change is uncomfortable Losing what is familiar is disconcerting. I get that. I understand. I know. I just wanted to start the conversation. Because at this time, children aren't in our midst. They're out in the community. They're in the parks. They're in the schools. They're supporting parents on their park runs. They're in the shopping trolleys as their mum or dad is pushing them around the supermarket. But they're not in our churches. And we really do have good news. And I really do want them to experience what I experienced this weekend where they were welcomed, where all the generations gathered together. And the word that I kind of settled on, as I, I've created a blessing for us, is around kind, being kind, kindness. Because being kind um, means that people do feel safe. Being kind means no, they know that they matter. Being kind means that you are willing to give some time to listen to somebody. Being kind means that you're going to help them when they're struggling to put up their tent. Being kind means that you're going to create that time to chat. That there's going to be opportunity to play. Being kind means that it feels safe. Being kind means that you've been thought of. And so, a blessing. May your church and community create the kind of space where all ages, all voices and perspectives gather and share. May your church community be kind to those who are sharing their thoughts aloud for the first time. And may you be the kind of person where others know that they are safe enough to share and to be truly heard. 
May you, may your church, may your community be known for being kind. Amen.